Hello and welcome to the Regulatory and Policy Roundtable, a conversation with CFTC and SEC commissioners. My name is Mike Pivovar and I'm a proud member of the advisory board of the Pacero Center for, Center for Financial Markets and Policy. It's my pleasure to moderate today's discussion with three members of the two federal agencies charged with regulating our financial markets, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission and the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, Christy Goldsmith Romero and Summer Mersinger have been CFTC commissioners since March of 2022. Um, and Hester Peirce has been an SEC commissioner since January of 2018. So let's get right into our discussion. Uh, one of the nice things about this annual conference is that we discuss um, emerging issues that are out there. Over the years, we've talked about things like financial crises, flash crashes, development of digital assets, blockchain technology, just to name a few. And currently, one of the subjects of, of topics that have been uh, discussed at a number of the sessions earlier today is the development of artificial intelligence and new applications uh, in finance um, and how that's, that's affecting things. We had earlier today, we had the uh, CEO of the London Stock Exchange Group, David Schwimmer, who pointed out, on the one hand, there's a lot of opportunities to do some responsible innovation and gave some examples. On the other hand, there's some risks. And he pointed out the fact that it allows, uh, AI just allows you to make the same mistakes, but with a greater confidence than you had before. Um, related to that spectrum of the opportunities and risks, uh, President Biden recently signed an executive order to, quote, ensure that America leads the way in seizing the promise and managing the risks of artificial intelligence, unquote. So I'd like to get our panelists' views on what they see as the opportunities and risks from a financial markets regulator's perspective to the financial market. So, Commissioner Goldsmith Romero, let's, uh, let's start with you. How are you thinking about AI developments in the commodities and futures markets? Oh, well, first, let me say thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Rena. Um, it's so great to be here. I'm, I'm on the panel here with, with three good friends. So this is um, really terrific for me. I'm going to give the standard disclaimer that we're all going to give that um, the views I'm about to give on my own as a commissioner do not necessarily uh, reflect the views of the commission or my fellow commissioner um, commissioners, no matter, sometimes I, I do try to convince this one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I work a lot on responsible AI uh, for the CFTC because I sponsor the Technology Advisory Committee. And so that is a plug for students um, that we are working on responsible AI and doing cutting edge stuff. I have gotten through the entire EO, um, but I've been uh, coordinating with the White House and, and uh, um, a lot of other regulators on this area. So when you think about AI, it's really a consequential technology. I, you know, if you think about the idea of the tremendous opportunities of sort of how it could address all these kind of bad things that we think of, just think about potential for healthcare or, or national security. But then there's this idea of like, there's one side of the coin is promise and there's one side of the coin is peril. And so how do we manage those risks? And I think as, as financial regulators, we shouldn't be scared of technology. I mean, otherwise we would be still trading in the pits and not having electronic trading that transformed our market. So we, we really are um, kind of looking at this and saying, okay, how do we get the promises of it um, while uh, avoiding the perils? AI has been around for a long time in our financial markets for a long time in a lot of different areas. And it's really generative AI that has, has caused um, a lot of, of conversation. and. Really, when you look at it, you're, you're just not sure where it's going to go. And so I sort of start with this. Well, we have to increase our capacity as the government to be able to understand that. We need to be in a lot of dialogue, um, as I am. I'm in a lot of dialogue with, with people who have talked here before and our exchanges and our clearinghouses and our, our brokers and our financial institutions, asking them about what do they use AI for, how do they think about AI for, using generative AI, uh, when we sort of look at what responsible AI is. This is essentially, um, it's going to be aligned with the interest of many stakeholders. You're going to use, uh, use it in, in the logic and the, in the decision making and the outcome need to be transparent, need to be explainable, need to be audible by humans. Um, you want to make sure it's unbiased data. You want to make sure it's used in a way that minimizes harm. 
you know, we just heard from the senator about the potential for market manipulation. That would obviously be a harm that you would want to minimize along, along with sort of um, issues with bias that have come up in our financial system. So as I think about it in terms of financial markets that we look at, there's a lot of uh, discussion that I've had with our market participants and our registered entities about the use for autom automation, you know, efficiency, accuracy, transparency. If you think about back office functions, if you think about regulatory compliance, I think about what it could do for uh, anti-money laundering as I've conducted a number of money laundering investigations. And so when you think about other things and you think about that promise and peril, you think, okay, if someone says, well, I want to use it to speed up trade settlement to T0. Okay, so then the question becomes, what are we losing potentially in those speed bumps that will then be gone? And so then we have to really sort of analyze that and figure that out to see where there's risk. Or if you look at, we're just gonna use AI to make margin calls. We're not, we're gonna maybe potentially use some of that, lose some of that human judgment that goes into um, making that decision and you could potentially knock someone out of their hedge uh, and potentially increase risk and, and, and potentially financial stability. When you look at models, uh, I think a lot of people get super excited about models, uh, particularly in the climate area, but also in like looking at exposure, looking at risk, trying to see where risk could bubble up. You've always had model risk, right? You, it's always about where you get the data from, what are the assumptions in the, in the data? And, and then when you look at things like giving investment advice, um, solely using AI, you're gonna say, well, are there fiduciary duties or um, other regulatory duties that, that you have to do? And then, and then it's really um, the government. I mean, I'm, I've got an enforcement background, so what we could do uh, in terms of surveillance, um, market oversight, uh, finding fraud, market manipulation is pretty excited. But then we have to like practice what we preach, right? Like we also have to do it safe and secure and responsible. Good, so thank you. So, so Commissioner Mersinger, your, your fellow commissioner, put up a lot of good things on the table. How are you thinking about it? Uh, I'm actually it, very similar to, to what Christy said. I'll start with my disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I forget. I'm glad I have you here to remind <laughs> me of my disclaimer. Um, but the views I expressed today are my own, and they do not necessarily reflect the commission or my fellow commissioners. But I think... Christie's doing a great job of digging in on this issue through her advisory committee and really looking at AI both, you know, with in our markets and where it could be helpful, but also within our agency. You know, we are a congressionally funded agency. We're a small agency. We need every opportunity we can get to be able to, you know, make our resources go further. And I think AI could really help us do that. So, you know, I also am thinking about where where can this be of use in our agency? How can we use it in a way that helps us better do our job? Um, you know, as she said, AI has been around. This isn't brand new technology, but sometimes you get technology that's maybe wrapped in new terminology that we haven't seen before. So we need to just make sure we are thinking through that and that we're understanding it and engaging with the public and stakeholders so we don't get frightened off by the new terminology and you know suddenly just say, no, we're not gonna allow this in our markets. Because uh, that would be, that would be just tragedy because I think it has so many opportunities. Yes, there are a lot of downfalls, but there's a lot we can do with this technology in the financial services markets, both from a market efficiency standpoint and then on the flip side from a transparency standpoint and the work we do um, trying to make sure that those markets are vibrant and reliable and also they're not subject to fraud and manipulation. Yeah, so let me pick up on that. So to your point about, you know, it's just, it's been around for a while. It's a new terminology, it's a new technology. Uh, Commissioner Peirce, um, you know, your, your colleague, uh, Gary Gensler, tends to focus on the risk side of the equation and argues that an AI caused financial crisis is quote unquote, nearly unavoidable um, without strict new regulations. Um, how do you think about balancing that? Are you more in the camp of Commissioner Mersinger, which is, hey, this is new technology, or, or Commissioner goldsmith Romero, we need to dialogue more with folks, learn more about this, think about responsible innovation, or do we need a whole set of new regulations in this space? 
Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks to Georgetown. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I, too, will give my disclaimer, which is that my views are my own views as a commissioner, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. And this is an area where I, I don't see um, the world exactly the same way that Chair Gensler does in terms of, of seeing the inevitability of a crisis based on AI. I do understand his point in the sense that if, you, if you're using AI technology and there are a few, only a few providers of AI technology um, and there's something wrong with it, then it could affect the whole market because everyone's using the same few large providers of AI technology. So I think that's something to pay attention to. The interesting thing though is that when you think about regulatory solutions to that, um, it, you have to be very careful because your regulatory solutions could end up making it even more likely that these three providers of, or however, you know, this handful of, of AI uh, providers ends up becoming the go-to set of, of uh, providers for everyone in the financial industry. So for example, we have a, a rule proposal out around predictive data analytics that would cover a lot of technologies. AI is, is roped into that. And I think one of the, it, it builds, it would, we're proposing to build a lot of processes around how people in the financial sector use those technologies, broker dealers and investment advisors specifically. And by building so many processes around a decision to use one of these technologies, you actually could make it um, much harder for a new provider to come in and compete because people are going to want to use the same ones that everyone else uses to sort of say, look, we're, we're, you know, we're doing what everyone else is doing, so don't come focus on us with your enforcement lens um, because we're just, we're just in the same pool with everyone else. So I think keeping barriers to entry low in terms of AI service providers is a really uh, useful way to prevent us from ending up in the, in the kind of circumstance that Chair Gensler um, is talking about. That said, I think it does make sense to be vigilant. As Christy and Summer have both said, you know, there are opportunities and there are risks. We need to think about new technologies, thinking about what the unique opportunities and risks are. And, and that then informs how we regulate uh, the new technology and how we use it ourselves. Yeah, and to your point about um, you know making sure we don't entrench sort of the incumbents in this space. And the earlier panel on the market structure panel, Jeff Davis from Nasdaq said that his point was that the SEC was deviating from its longstanding approach of being technology agnostic and sort of tipping the balance. It sounds very similar to to your concerns in this area. Yeah, I think we really are um, sort of taking a new approach to the technology that would potentially even throw a, throw aside tools that we've traditionally used, such as disclosure, and say no, that's not enough. Okay. So, Commissioner uh, Goldsmith, from Maryland, let me come back to you. So you talked about the importance of having dialogue uh, right. with folks, and you talked about your advisory committee. Can you t spend a few minutes explaining what an advisory committee is for folks yeah. out there, how you get this information, and then with the caveat that you're still gathering information, have, have you identified any areas where you think your agency needs new authority um, we would need new authority to come from Congress to, for you to do what you want to do in this space. So the, the CFTC has advisory committees, the SEC does too, and so we have, you know, a, we need a broad, diverse representation of stakeholders who come in and advise us on things. So this could be industry in some way, it could be academics, it, it could be all kinds of things. What I did when I took over the Technology Advisory Committee, which was really uh, a lot of the same lobbyists and lawyers was I just wiped it all clean and put actual technology experts on. So we actually have experts in responsible AI. They are not experts in responsible AI and financial services because I'm not sure that exists yet, although it will. Um, but I think they're just experts from Brookings, from IBM. And, and then we have others and others in, who are fintech ex experts like um, CEOs and founders of, of, of technology companies, that kind of thing. So what we have done is we have held two public meetings already about responsible AI, what that means, um, and you know, what are sort of the standards or principles that are being discussed out there that could potentially guide it. A lot of this may be very high level, uh, um, the senator talked about NIST, right? NIST is a, a principle-based standard. I'm a proponent of, of NIST uh, applying in the space of AI. It's, it's very flexible, 
but it does create certain standards like, like governance, which you have to look at and say, you know, governance means who's making the decision on the deployment of AI and who determines whether that's responsible and what the parameters are. I think there's gonna be a lot of existing regulations that already apply, and this is always the case when we're talking about tools, right? You're gonna have risk management, you're gonna have uh, oversight over third parties. Um, there's gonna be operational resilience requirements, but I, I think the idea of, of saying this is what we need to have is, is really tough right now. This is changing constantly. We don't even know all the use cases. Um, we don't know the stakes. We don't know um, everything that's happening is is being you know. It's it's interesting. The senator was saying that he was he was surprised that when he was talking to some banks, he wasn't getting like, here's our plan. I I'm getting the same thing. Like I'm getting this is how we're starting to think about it, but it's very broad. And so I think um, if I'm invited here next year. <laughs> the landscape will have changed entirely, right? I mean, that's what I think. I think as 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 um, people in, in companies and industry and regulated entities start to actually implement it, um, they're going to come up with their own concerns, their own controls. Um, they might say we're going to implement the NIST framework uh, or something like that. Um, and I think this is a, a really good situation where regulators need to just continue to be in a dialogue with our registered entities so we have an understanding. Um, and if we need to issue clarifying guidance, we can, but I, I don't know yet yeah. on new, um, new laws, but pr high principle frameworks are something that I'm very interested in, like the NIST framework. Okay, so too early to tell. Commissioners Mersinger and Purse, are you in that, that camp, or have you identified areas already? I, I completely agree with Christy, and, and I certainly, I, I don't ever like to say, yes, we need more regulations, yes, we need more laws, because that's just not my nature and what the, kind of the approach I take to things, um, but it's just too early to tell. We have a lot of education and, and understanding that we need to do as regulators before we can really decide what steps we may need to take. Yeah. And I don't think we need new authority. I, what I do worry about in this space is that um, people are a little scared, and so I think they want to move to a model of per permissioned innovation. I'm very much a fan of permissionless innovation, let people try things. You obviously have to comply with the existing regulatory structure, but we don't need to set up a new gating mechanism for AI technology. All right, great. All right, let's move on to another uh, very topical issue, um, climate. Um, the Biden administration from the beginning has prioritized climate risks as a focus, not just in other parts of the government, but for financial regulators like no other administration's uh, ever done. So it's just as one example, the Treasury Department, the Treasury Secretary, who acts as a coordinator among the financial regulators, among other duties, appointed the first ever climate counselor and, and established a climate hub in the office of the secretary to set the strategic um, uh, direction of Treasury's climate work and coordinate information sharing across the agency. So Commissioner Mersinger, let me come to you first. What, what's the proper role of the CFTC when it comes to various climate issues? Well, I've always found this uh, discussion interesting. I grew up on a farm and I always say, I grew up in a situation where there was climate financial risk all the time. I mean, my, my parents' livelihood was growing crops in the ground, and you could have a hailstorm or a tornado come through and wipe out your entire, you know, everything that you could possibly, um, you know, make for the year. So, you know, and there's a lot of tools in place that farmers use to, you know, kind of manage this risk, um, whether it's crop insurance or hedging in futures markets. So, I've always been interested in when people are saying, you know, this new financial risk that comes from climate, I've always said, I don't know if it's new, um, because given my background, we've always had this financial risk, um, and it's very real risk. So when I look at our role at the CFTC, I think about how our markets can be used to manage and hedge that risk. I said farmers have been using our markets to hedge risk for since the beginning of our agency. That's not going to change. And really, 
as we see more extreme weather patterns, I think that just means our markets are going to become more important. And uh, a tool that, that we really need to make sure is available and um, you know, provides the mitigation um, resources so that you know, farmers and ranchers can, can hedge those, those kind of volatile um, times in their production. So I really look at it as you know, making sure that our markets do what they're supposed to do, you know, offer price discovery and hedging opportunities. And we do have climate-related products that are, that are now trading on a number of our registered exchanges. Um, there, are, um, there are futures products on voluntary carbon markets. Um, again, our job is to do what we do with all, of our, with all of our products, make sure that the products are not you know, susceptible to manipulation, um, do what we can to make sure that they are liquid and that they are able to help with price discovery and again, allow people to hedge. So that's really, I don't think we have any new responsibilities. I think that our markets were designed to help manage risk, climate risk included. Commissioner Goldsmith Romero, he raised. So let me, let me tell you how fun it is uh, to work with Commissioner Mersinger. So this uh, year- I don't know what story she's I don't know, she has, <laughs> she, there's so many stories. <laughs> yeah. I'm scared. This year, no, 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 this year, her, the two of us, we went to a, a grain elevator that was on the Missouri River. And you know, there's a chute that shoots the grain from the elevator out into the barge on the river. But because of drought, the water levels were low. Now, just so you know, the Mississippi had such drought that, that barges were stranded this year. So that's like food rotting, right? And, you, and then they can't get it through. So we're, we're talking to, and this is, this is a registered entity with us, and, and they're explaining to us the difficulty, like look at the line on the barge, it's only at four feet. We can't fill this barge, right? We're gonna have to half fill the barge, then we're gonna have to truck grain, then we're going to have to move this barge down river to where it's um, deeper, pay to have the trucks, find another way to shoot it into. This is, this is real world, right? And this is what we've been, we've been learning in, in this role, which is really fascinating. So then the next question becomes, OK, so what do you do? How do you hedge that risk? This is a very real risk. And, and so, look, I'm a markets person, right? So I, when I was confirmed, I said my number one priority is make sure market, these markets are working well. These markets are, are there like for, to help manage this. Um, as Summer said, these markets have long been used by agriculture. Energy also use it. Winter is, is coming, not to quote Game of Thrones, but <laughs> you know, there's going to be issues that come up um, with things like our power grid and storms and all that co that come with that and so you know my priority has been ensuring that our markets are resilient to climate risk and a lot of that is really kind of understanding what that risk is one of the things i did was i worked um, for more than a year with the national futures association to um, go to their largest members a lot of banks and brokers and understand how they are accounting for climate risk and what we learned in this special project was it wasn't a standalone risk. It was just embedded in all the traditional risk, credit risk, market risk, liquidity risk, counterparty risk. Um, and, uh, and then I have spent time talking with our exchanges and our clearinghouses about their stress testing that they do related to climate. I've called for more stress testing for scenario analysis of our largest players so that we can understand this more. But you know, we spend... Um, a lot of time with our economists, uh, each time there's a, a climate event saying, okay, what are the impacts on the market? Let's track it. This is very real for us. On top of that, so that's physical risk, right? On top of that, you've got transition risk with the transition to a lower carbon environment. And our markets are being used for that. Number one, we have metals and minerals markets. So the electrification of America um, depends, on, depends on that story too the two of us standing on the edge of a copper mine in, in Utah, <laughs> and, then, and then meeting with traders in copper, and then meeting with uh, one of our um, large exchanges who re just released uh, um, um, some different, a lithium and what's called molybdenum um, 
futures contracts and that all relates to batteries and all that. So this is, these are things we're actively looking at along with just our regular uh, derivatives products that can hedge things like interest rates for investments in the IRA or, or that. And so these are the types of things we're doing. Uh, on top of that, uh, I do have an enforcement background. The market integrity part of this is important. Uh, we are in this space and so I advocated for um, and we, we, just re we just launched an environmental fraud task force. I've been working very closely with them uh, to bring integrity to the market. So we have, a, we have um, you know, a really special area, I think, that we're doing, and it, it is very real, and it's been really terrific to, to work with Commissioner Mersinger with her background to understand it, and then to get out to real people and, and see, okay, well, how are you using the market to help with that? Wow. So when I was with the SEC, I always thought it was cool going to a trading desk or an exchange. But yeah. you guys get to go to like grain elevators That's and right. copper mines and stuff and yes. put on a, hard hats and everything. I was a little worried Christy was going to tell a story about the time we inadvertently kidnapped a senator in Arkansas. But we, we that, did. that was but she also set up. Um, we did. She, for, for it's a story a for another day. But she's story for another day. Yes, she set up this is how you really get invited good, back next year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You'll but she to set me up for next year for the story. <laughs> yeah. She set me up for my advisory committee, the, the energy and environmental markets. And we are looking into metal markets and also physical energy infrastructure and how that will impact the derivatives markets. So thank yeah, you for that. Absolutely. Good. So before I come to Commissioner Peirce, uh, to get her views on the SEC's uh, proposed climate risk disclosure rule. Earlier this morning, um, Chair Benham uh, made news. In fact, right after his panel, Politico came out with a, a story on this. Uh, uh, Commissioner Mercer, you mentioned the voluntary carbon markets. He made news saying that the long-awaited guidance may be coming out at the end of the month um, and that you all had just gotten the guidance uh, recently. Any, any comments on that? So, I mean, I've been um, working on the voluntary carbon market uh, area for a while. I talk a lot about this. It's a, it's a market that's very fragmented. It, it doesn't, there's not really standards. It, it doesn't have a lot of investor confidence. And so you're seeing the demand really drop at, as opposed to it being used as a, as a, a tool or an opportunity in, in the transition to a lower carbon environment. So I've been calling for, uh, for we have uh, voluntary carbon credit futures uh, contracts that trade on our exchanges. I have met with the exchanges to discuss with them what are the standards that are in place. This is a, a long-standing issue that I've had that I do think we need to have some guidance on exchange listing standards in that. Um, I'm looking forward to, to, to seeing that and, and commenting. Um, there are standard setting bodies out there um, like um, the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets that former SEC Commissioner Annette Nazareth heads up. Spent a lot of time talking with Annette about that. Um, but it's, it's a tough space, but it's one that you know we are in and we are regulating it. And so if we're going to be in there and regulating it, I do think we need to work with the exchanges on their standards. So it's been really another one where there's a lot of dialogue. I'm still reviewing it. I think what's most important to me is that we need to remember that, yes, we regulate the exchanges who are offering derivatives on voluntary carbon markets, but we don't regulate the underlying spot market or cash market for those voluntary carbon credits. So any guidance we are giving needs to be directed at our registered and our um, exchanges versus to the voluntary carbon market you know, itself. And we also need to make sure people understand that we are not regulating that spot market. We do have fraud and manipulation enforcement authority, but we're not looking at that spot market day to day. And that, you know, that's something that people need to just be aware of that, you know, I don't want to, us to somehow say that we're going to be policing this space now. Um, because we have futures products trading on it. So that's kind of what I, the way I'm looking at it. Great. All right. So Commissioner Purr, so we mentioned the SEC has a rule proposal outstanding, the so-called climate risk disclosure rule proposal that would require certain public companies registered with the SEC to provide certain climate risk disclosures. There's a lot of people who have been critical of that rule. You are one. Um, and so why do you think this rule is not an appropriate use of the SEC's regular authority authority um, I, I just think it's it's unnecessary for us to look at a particular area um, and 
have particular uh, a particular risk area and have particular disclosures tied to that. So while CFTC commissioners are at the Mississippi and visiting mines, I'm over in Europe talking to European bureaucrats about how we should use our capital markets to channel uh, capital toward um, toward the transition, right? And and my view is that this is really a way of um, you know it's a really really interesting thing to watch, right? It's it's central planning through climate change disclosure regulation. And look, I have no no qualms or no problem with with market participants looking at interesting new technologies and ways that we can deal with climate issues and other other issues that we're confronting as a as a people. But the best way for that to happen is for for capital to flow voluntarily based on um, based on decisions made by private market participants, not decisions made by someone, a regulator like me saying, here's how I think boards of public companies ought to be thinking about climate. Um, and I think we need to be really careful that we're not falling into what is happening in other parts of the world where government regulators really are using a disclosure framework to shift capital uh, flows toward toward technologies they think will be transformative um, rather than allowing the, it to flow to the, the technologies that we can't see now, but actually will be transformative. So, so your fellow panelists have given some examples of you know, how the, the, the CFTC does have a proper role in some areas. And is, is, is there any area in which the SEC does have a proper role? I mean, look, companies are already making climate-related disclosures, and our, our staff and in our division of corporation finance looks at those disclosures along with other disclosures. Um, companies that are facing risks that are climate that are related to climate change or climate transition um, are already, if those are material risks, they're already telling us about those, and that's and that's disclosure that our staff reviews and sometimes pushes back and asks questions on. I don't see the need to do anything else. Now, obviously, we have this proposal out in front of us. A lot of, a lot of market participants have come and said, yeah, we'd like to have a, just tell us what we have to disclose. And there have been certain representatives of investors or asset, often it's large asset managers who come in and they want climate data from public companies because they've made, they've made promises um, to you know, to, to be part of net zero efforts. So they want the, the information for their use. And look, I get, the, I get the desire to have just one set of rules you have to answer to when it comes to disclosure around climate, but one, private climate standard setters are probably not gonna leave. And two, just because you stick something in an SEC rulemaking doesn't mean that you'll get comparable and accurate information. So I think the rules that we have work, but you know, I'm open, I, we're, we're wading through a lot of comment letters. Um, and so we'll, we'll have to see how the final rule comes out and then I'll, I'll assess whether that's the way to go or not. Great, so we have a couple minutes before we open it up for questions, and audi questions in, uh, from the audience. I wanna switch to digital assets, crypto cryptocurrency. So there's been some discussion in some earlier sessions today about the two big bills that are working their way through Congress. So one is the broader digital asset market structure bill, which would deal with the vast majority of digital assets, so-called cryptocurrencies. And then a second bill it would focus just solely on stable coins. So, so Commissioner Purse, let me start with you, since you are known as Crypto Mom, um, based upon uh, your interest in this, literally Crypto Mom, um, and has you have thousands of Twitter followers because of this, yeah, right? Yeah, but most of them now call me evil Crypto Stepmom. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it sounds like a Disney movie, right? So, Could be. Yeah, there you go. So I'd, I'd love, you know, there's been so many calls for to provide legal clarity for digital assets. What's what's your view on on on, on both of these bills? Well, I'm I'm happy that Congress is looking at whether they think uh, you know where they think authority should lie around crypto assets. We at the SEC have not handled this area well, and as a result, I think you've seen more people get harmed than otherwise would have if we had had a, a framework in place. There's some things that we could have done ourselves without having a new statutory framework. There are other things for which a new statutory framework would be helpful. But I'm, I'm really enthusiastic to see that Congress has taken this on. It's a bipartisan issue. You've got a lot of people 
on both sides of the aisle who are seeing the value in having some sort of a regulatory framework in place. Um, and, and so I'm excited to see what comes of that. But in the meantime, I think we're you know, continuing down the track of, of, of trying to use our enforcement authority. And I, frankly, I think the CFTC is doing some of this too, using enforcement authority to try to mark jurisdictional territory. And, and those are the kind of situations where it really is helpful for Congress to come in. Good. Commissioner Mersinger? Yeah, this is one of those areas where I will, will say, you know, we do need um, some legislation. We do need some new statutes um, because there is this kind of lack of clarity. And, and I think the only way to get there is through the legislative process. And I'm more comfortable with the legislative process. Those are elected officials who have, you know, a responsibility to the constituents to take all sides into consideration and hopefully come up with a compromise. Unfortunately, the way we've been approaching it to a certain extent is we are making these decisions through enforcement cases, a lot of times settlements, um, and that doesn't provide the market any clarity. Um, that's, that's, you know, it, it doesn't help, you know, continue to, you know, the innovators pushing them forward, but in a responsible manner. So this is an area where I do think we need legislation. I think there's been a lot of really smart people looking at this on the Hill for, for years now. Um, and, you know, I think at some point we'll, we'll see a lot of this legislation maybe kind of come together in one bill. Uh, and hopefully it does have some sort of framework where we can work with our with the SEC and with other financial regulators to maybe lay out some parameters because you know anything can be tokenized and even traditional assets that you know fall into under regulators you know it could be tokenized that doesn't mean that it needs to go through a new regulatory regime so how do we define that how do we do that so I think we're I think we'll get there it's just there's also a lot of fraud in the name of crypto. Um, we, we had our enforcement results out at the end of the year, and there was this discussion about this large number of crypto-related fraud cases we brought. I would say a lot of those involved no crypto. They said they were going to buy crypto. They just took your money and left. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is that crypto fraud? Not really. That's just run-of-the-mill fraud. So I think we have to also <laughs> remember that, you know, when you have a new area where there's not a regulator looking at kind of the what we call the cash markets, it's a lot easier for the fraudsters to take advantage of that. And people want to put their money here. And unfortunately, they are, there's a lot of people getting taken advantage of. So hopefully we'll see something from Congress in, you know, maybe a year or so. I, I don't know. For, I, yeah. I, I never uh, try to guess what Congress is going to do, but Same. hopefully it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> So, Commissioner Goldsworth, real, real quick, we're going to go to Q&A, yeah, and, and sure. if we give priority to students first, uh, yeah, that would be I'll, great. I'll keep it really short. Um, I'm glad Congress is looking at it. I certainly think that there is a need for some legislation. There are some regulatory gaps. I mean, I, I think the federal government as a whole needs to also do a better job at trying to... Um, work together on this. Uh, I, I just don't want people to get hurt. And and so, you know, I welcome legislation. I don't want to comment on any specific legislation. The other thing is I, I think we can do better on issuing some guidance ourselves. One of the areas that I've called for that is um, related to affiliated entities. And we have a real serious issue with this. FTX is a perfect example. Right. You have all of these affiliated entities and sometimes they want to be, um, you know, they want to be the broker, the exchange, the clearinghouse, the market maker, the custodian. And at some point, you know, obviously there's conflicts of interest, but there might be other risks or things like that. And so rather than take those up on an application by application basis, you know, I, I do want us to, to lay out a regulatory framework, a guidance or, or clarifying what the rules are that apply and, and how we're going to take a look at that. That's just one area, but that's a really, really important area. On legislation, I do would like to see Congress give us a little more authority to be able to look into affiliates to the extent that they're gonna impact our registered entity. Obviously, we had a FTX affiliate as a registered entity with us. 
uh, and had no visibility into the affiliates that, that caused so much damage. And that's, that's a very difficult situation to be in as a regulator. Thanks. All right, so we got time for one question. Hi, my name's Ashita, and I'm an undergraduate student here at Georgetown. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. But I was wondering, so there are, of course, many businesses that operate internationally as a result are required to disclose financial reports to various international regulatory agencies, especially if they're traded publicly. When developing climate policy, are your agencies looking at creating your own objectives or maybe aligning your object objectives and reporting standards with other nations? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is a really important question. Um, as, as I mentioned, Europe is kind of in a different place than we are. Um, and, and this is, it's not only Europe, but I think Europe has been quite aggressive at trying to apply its regulations extraterritorially in this area because they're putting so many requirements around um, climate-related disclosures, but it's not only climate-related disclosures, it's a whole other set of, for lack of a better word, environmental, social, and governance um, uh, issues that, that they want disclosures on. And, and it's costing their companies a ton of money to gather and produce this data. And so I think from a competitive standpoint, they're looking and trying to see how they can, how they can make sure that US companies also have to comply with those. So we have to think about that. I don't know what the solution um, to that is. But I think it's also important to remember that when I look at our disclosure obligations, my, my job is to get financially material information to investors. Um, in Europe and some other places, they've made a decision that they want not only information that's material, financially material uh, to the company, but also looking outwards, what is the effect that the company is having on the world around it? So that's something called double materiality, and that is not, um, that's just not part of our mandate. And so there we're unlikely to come to the same place. Yeah. Commissioners, any comments? International coordination. Yeah. So I, I, that's that's, that's where I defer yeah. to Hester on that. Okay, good. All right, well, we're out of time, so perfect. So please join me in thanking the commissioners for giving their time today. Great, thank you all.